It's Wednesday, January 23rd, and this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we review the Four Immigrants manga. Let's do this. Well, we were almost going to go to a con this weekend. Almost. There's a tiny, tiny chance we'll go. I think the chance is zero. I'm already planning on going skiing this weekend. I'm instead. also planning on working on stuff instead of uh, going. But, but yeah, this week still it, a tiny chance. Because we don't go. I mean, we haven't been to gaming cons a lot ever since UberCon moved an hour further south and didn't have Luke Crane. <laughs> it's like, wow, there's no reason to go now. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, there's this gaming con, Dreamation, this weekend. Hey, screw it, let's go. Luke Crane's gonna be there. And, uh, yeah, then we realized, oh, Luke Crane's events, according to, I think, the con chair, whoever it was who emailed us back, filled up within, quote, minutes of the schedule going online. Yeah, uh, I guess he's a hit, right? And if he's such a hit, well, uh, think of this. how come we, he's not making more money? Think about this. We were about to go to a con and sign up to do multiple events run by one guy with whom we have gone to multiple events in the past. I can imagine us getting there and him saying, you guys again, what the fuck? Let me show Burning Wheel to someone else. I mean, in the history, You already know it exists. In the history of role-playing, have there ever been, like, rock star dungeon masters and, like he is? I mean, seriously. I mean, I think the closest thing is, theoretically, I mean, if, in terms of famousness or awesomeness, you could look at, like, Gary Gygax. But, but I mean, when, when Gary Gygax... When was the last time he ran a campaign for anyone? Yeah, I mean, seriously, I guess... I guess if he ran a thing at a at a convention, like ran a game for people, that people would sign up like crazy, but mostly for his name. You know, people, Luke, Luke Crane isn't a famous name. People are signing up because his games are actually awesome. You Luke know? Crane should be a famous name, however. God damn. It's like, you know, I don't know. I'm not really, uh, I'm, and we're people who aren't deep into that circle. I mean, I'm sure people who are deeper into the gaming cons recognize other names of people running games and sign up, you know, based on that. But to think that someone, you know, it has a name, and you just you sign up for a game based on the name alone, and you're not a gaming con person. That's pretty big. It's funny how though, and other people seem to do the same thing. They look and if they a burning wheel event does not excite them. It only excites them if they see run by Lou Crane. Well, actually, I think some of the other burning wheel events did fill up also. And- oh, of course they did. But I wonder how many of those people didn't realize that while it's probably going to be awesome, it's not Luke himself. Yeah. Or maybe it is. You know that guy. He could probably run two burning wheels simultaneously, <laughs> just in two different rooms. But also, uh, there were some other... They, they said they were, the, they were going to talk to him about you know Dexcon, which is the con I was planning on going to, which is run by the same people in July that uh, they're going to try to get Luke to bring more DMs to run more Burning Wheels. I'd say we could do it, but I'm not uh, ready for that. No, no, not at all. I would, I would be, uh, people who signed up for my game would be quite disappointed. But uh, speaking of cons, I'm not going to go with, talk about this forever, but I have to point out that in February, there's a convention called KatsuCon, pretty much one of my favorite February, cons. February what? Eh, February. The point is, we are running... A whole crazy ton of events there. We're going to be in the video game room the whole, every time we're not running crazy events. Uh, I highly recommend, if you're a fan of Geek Nights and a fan of anime, that you go to Katsukan. It's February 15, 16, 17, so not this weekend. Nah. Not the weekend after that. Not the weekend after that. But the weekend after that. Now, there, there has been a schedule change. We're only running six events instead of seven. Oh no six events god <laughs> damn i think the highlighting event is going to be the uh late show katsu late night katsukan friday night from 10 30 to 1 a.m you mean what take. oh so so wait let me see what the description of that event is in the con book it says right here oh um watch scott sleep ah. no that's a wonderful event i like i thought it. you said you had a monologue written <laughs> i don't have shit <laughs> great what are you talking about? good game i got like four weeks right yeah, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Anyway, in actual anime news, uh, a while ago we talked about a show that we were really excited about because of the trailer. And then we watched the show, and it was an okay show, but uh, it was not quite what I expected. Well, that show was picked up, and now it is going to be available. And in fact, on February 19th, the first DVD of Moonlight Mile is going to be coming out in the U.S. for you to see in English. Didn't we do a Geek Nights about... We did a Geek Nights about Moonlight Mile. We did, but I think we have a lot of new listeners since then. And also, I want to remind you, it's out. If uh, you think a show about men striving to become astronauts and beef and friendship and camaraderie and all that business in space, and independently of that, you really want to see a bunch of Sherpas have an orgy, this show is for you. 
<laughs> I guess. <laughs> At least two female Sherpas. Well, then the, there were the guys there. And then there's that other random sex scene in episode two. And then I, I think there's a random sex scene in at least one per episode for the rest yeah. of the show. I've seen the manga for it in various Japanese bookstores. I'm wondering how close the uh, manga is to the anime. Well, it is going to be on uh, Anime Network's Video On Demand in the end of, in the end of this month. So, uh, Oh, I guess they got to put something on that Anime Network, right? They pretty much put every ADV show on there anyway. So Yeah, and ADV picked this up. So, what do you mean? Uh, mm. Is that all you got? That's all I got. Okay, so... There's no anime news. There's nothing to talk no, about. There's no anime news. And that's why Geek Bite. Geek Bite is... Uh, you're going to have a lot of Geek Bites on Wednesday because a lot of comics and things that I read and wa- an anime that I watch that Rim doesn't. And this is a way to sort of get them out to you without waiting until we can do a full show on them. So I'm actually going to tell you about something mad old. I'm going to talk to you about Galaxy Express 3.9 TV show. Now, way back in the high school days, like 98... 99, right? Before I was big into the Animes. I gotta stop saying Animes. Uh, I was watching the Sci-Fi Channel, and there was like a week of anime. And that's that was like sort of like the tipping point in the anime fandom of myself. Wow, for me it was in fourth grade. Yeah. <laughs> On the uh, Sci-Fi Network, Vampire Hunter, it was D, sort of like a, it was sort of like a... 8 Man After, Project A. Co. Yeah, okay, it was like a little slope. And then that week, at, the week of anime was like the, the peak. And then it just sort of was downhill, like whoosh, from there into the anime club, right? But one of the things they showed was uh, the Galaxy Express 3.9 movie and then the second Galaxy Express 3.9 movie. And more than any of the other movies that I saw that week, those were the ones that were like, oh, man. Because there's, uh, there's not much get, that gets better for me in anime than watching some outer space opera, Leiji Matsumoto, late at night, in the dark, alone. I recall, I think I watched, uh, like, Urusei Yatsura 2, and then I fell asleep before uh, 3.9's yeah, came on. Yeah, that one works, though, for uh, late night, dark, aloneness. That's, <laughs> a, that's a good sort of semi-space opera-ish kind of anime. It has, a, it has that kind of late night mood, you know? But anyway, so I had watched the movies, and... You know, if you don't realize, the first Galaxy Express 3.9 movie is a compilation movie that sort of summarizes the TV show. And you know what? More than any compilation movie I've ever seen, it summarizes the TV show up damn well. Like, it is a substitute for the TV show if you do not want to watch 113 TV episodes. But the 113 TV episodes, surprisingly, are not like, you know, bad. It's not like they cut out bad stuff. It's just that... The TV show is not Monster of the Week. It's more like Planet of the Week. You know, every every week the train stops at a different planet and they get out and they do something and then they get back on the train, you know? And the thing is, slowly over time throughout the series, they reveal more and more things about the main plot. You know, like, oh, my tell is all mysterious. And... Oh, where did that, you know, that gun belong to someone who'd belong to? Or, oh, there's a train in space. Where's it going to go? Yeah. The thing is, from watching the TV show, I think even though the compilation movie is still fantastic, and that's something everyone should see, the TV show is also fantastic. I mean, a lot of these, some of the planets of the week are kind of weird. Like, there's one where they get off a planet where these amorphous blobs live. Yeah, that, that episode was not so good. But Hey, nothing wrong with a Moopy. How dare you discriminate? They weren't Moopies. They were not good. No <laughs> Moopy games? No, no Moopy games. Great. No. But something that, what I like about the show is that, first of all, you get to see a lot more of the universe. Like, you're seeing these, like, non-3-9 trains and all this other stuff going on that you don't get to see so much in the movie. And also, each episode, sometimes there's a multi-part story, but, you know, each, I guess, story within the TV show has a really good, like, sci-fi kind of message to it. And it's like, ah. Uh. Granted, the message of all, pretty much every one of these works always seems to come down to something along the lines of, ah, gave up my humanity, but for what? I sure well, hope you don't of, give up your humanity. Actually, a lot of them aren't about humanity. There's some about environment stuff, and some about family, and some about... You know, uh, being poverty. And oh, yeah, but you cannot deny that a lot of them involve, well, oh, the snap, main someone <laughs> gave up their humanity the and main, it didn't work out for the them. The main theme of the show is, you know, b- p- turning yourself into, uh, changing your regular body for a machine body. And you see some people regretting it and some people enjoying it and some people liking it but then being assholes. And, you know, they show it, they pretty much show you all sides. And uh, unlike the movie, which is sort of just like, 
machine body's bad. The TV show sort of really mixes it up over time, and any one of these episodes make would make a real pretty decent short sci-fi story on its own. I can give you all the one warning. It's not really a warning because I, I love this stuff. I eat it up, but I, I will say, be prepared anytime you watch any Leiji Matsumoto work for not drama, but melodrama. Uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's uh, there's people fan subbing it right now. They just put out episode 24 today, and I'm gonna watch all of this. Fair, watch out. I'm watching every single episode, and I really like that closing song too. It reminds me a lot of those old show closing songs, like the Macross closing song. I like all that old kind of anime opener closer music. Yeah, and the opening song is like you know a Japanese guy going oh, rah, rah, you know, one of those. <laughs> I like this action. It's good action. If you're uh. If you're not downloading the fan subs, maybe you should. You're not going to ever... It's never going to be on DVD. No, <laughs> no don't say who's that. Gonna, well, who's going to be able to sell 113 episodes of, of, a, of a show from, like, 1979? Well, uh, yeah, someday... Yeah, show is older than I am. Someday, it'll be in the uh, public domain. Yeah, after I die. <laughs> Things of the day. So everyone gets one. I mean, Scott and I have our initial D and uh, some one of our friends watches Bleach. You know, everyone has their one like shonen fighting kind of, oh my God, is he going to do the thing for episode long battle between two people kind of show. Everyone gets one that they really like. And Emily has recently found hers. It's this baseball show and it's just crazy. The pitcher catcher, something's going to happen. Oh my God, drama. But uh, I always wanted to watch a baseball anime, but it's hard to get them because they're not in English. Well, this one's being fan subbed. Oh, really? What's I believe. It, what's it called? I don't even remember. Eh. Be- partly because I'm in Windows now, I'm using my fancy uh, Cool Edit Pro instead of any sort of crap program in Linux, but the problem is Windows not so great and Windows not used so often, so Japanese no worky. Uh-huh. It's a lot of question marks here. All right. But, uh, you know, in, in America, we have fan art and fan works, but they always take that kind of to the next level in Japan. Yeah, the cosplay and, is way better than ours. Daikon animation. Yeah. <laughs> we lose. <laughs> they, they rule. Yeah. But uh, one, one thing that is done in Japan, and this is being done more and more, partly just because technology is making it easier, but at the same time, this is the kind of thing where you look and say, wow, I think I'll just draw fan art. People take, uh, you might have seen these before, the opener to a show. And then they take characters from another show and they fully reanimate the opener to the first show with the characters and the inside jokes from the second show. Uh. Now, granted, this is not I was very, very impressed by this until Emily pointed out that most of these people either rotoscope or trace or just like over overdo it with keyframes and just figure and just reanimate exactly and change the heads. and Yeah, flash helps a lot. But at the same time, that's still quite a bit of work. It is a lot more work than making an AMV where you're just copying, cutting, and pasting. But of all of these, this is probably the high, one of the highest quality ones, and it is, too, that baseball show. It is the opener to Azamanga Dio, but it is that show. Uh, it's pretty high quality. The quality is pretty high, but the entertainment value for me was not so high. You didn't even watch it. I watched part of it. You watched two seconds of it before I opened up another window to look something up. No, I watched it uh, before. Emily sent it to me the other day. Ah, oh, well, you're just a cold-hearted bastard. Oh, I was like 10, 15 seconds of it. Ah. <laughs> and I think then I is... said, I basically said, oh, I get the joke. Okay, I'm done. I think it's really funny. And also, if you're looking for a, a crazy initial D-style baseball show, whatever the show is called, question mark, question mark, question mark, plus question mark. Ooh, sounds like a good show to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so check this out. You know uh, Totoro, right? I do. We should do a show on Totoro, probably. Maybe we have to watch Totoro again. Okay, it's been a while. It's been a long time. Um, you know that the, the picture that always you always see of Totoro at the bus stop with the umbrella and the, the girl hiding under it, whatever, right? Some guy who lives in uh, I don't know. I guess this is Nagasaki because it says on the top of the web page, Web News, the Nagasaki Shimbun HP. Um, I can't read anything else on the site, obviously, because it's in uh, Moon language. But there's a picture of a guy, of not the guy, but apparently a guy made a Totoro statue with an umbrella and put it at the bus stop in his town, and it looks just like the bus stop in Totoro. So if it's raining, you can go to the bus stop and stand under the Totoro's umbrella. Did he do this with permission? Was it a commission? Did he just do it? I think he just did it I, because he wanted to. 
out of like niceness, like a bored old retired man or something. I don't know. It's not enough details in English for me to tell you, but it's cool nonetheless. And there's a picture, which is enough to make a thing of the day. So tonight, uh, to get right along with the main bit here, we're going to talk about something. I guess you should all put on your uh, erudite hats. Your highbrow hats. Yes. Uh, oh, <laughs> hip, hip, very cheerio. Yes. We're not going to talk with fake British accents. Or maybe we should put on our beanies because we're so such intellectual artists. I believe you mean berets. All oh, right, a right. beanie is the exact opposite. Of, yeah, I meant. I was thinking. Know, of, uh, in my brain was a picture of a beret, but fact, out of my mouth came the word beanie. In fact, I would say if ever there were two hats that were diametrically opposed in the most extreme way possible, it would be the beret and the beanie. Perhaps I don't think so. Have, I would uh, think. Perhaps I would you could think, have a three-way of the beret on, on the top and then down at the bottom left of the triangle is the beanie and the bottom right is the German spike helmet. Well, I was thinking the spike helmet would definitely be in one part of the triangle and the beanie in the other, but I think that the uh, beret would actually be somewhere between on the line between the beanie and the top hat. No, because the top hat is class without pretension. I don't know. The beret, you can't get away with unless you are a percussionist or you are in France. Well, then where do you place the bowler hat? The bowler hat is classy, classier than a top hat, I say. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> let's talk about the uh, the intellectual business here. It's no puppy helmet. No. So we're going to talk about tonight something kind of amazing, something kind of interesting. It's not the, uh, it's not like this great entertaining thing to read. It's more of a historical document. It's the kind of thing you would read for a class. Yes, it's it's sort of like the. the it's a book where the the contents of the book itself, right, are only fascinating from a meta perspective. Sort of like, you know, the the fact of what it is is more important than the actuality of what it is when you read it, the contents. So, so tonight we're going to talk about the, the Four Immigrants manga, which was written by a man named Henry Kiyama in San Francisco. And it chronicles the uh, experience of Japanese immigrants to the United States from, give or take, 1904 to 1924. So turn of the century, you know, late industrial revolution. Like, this is world fair times. Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, way back in the early 20th century, this Japanese guy comes to the U.S., he immigrates here to San Francisco, and while he's here, he sort of draws manga of his experiences. And the manga is in sort of part English, part Japanese that... You know, no one could really understand except for people who were in his situation. And, you know, uh, what happened was Frederick Schott, who's like... The, he's one of those epic kind of he's, anime manga guys he's pretty, in the U.S. Well, he's pretty much like the the foremost academic authority on animes and mangas. Or at least the foremost English academic authority on animes and mangas and Tezuka and all that kind of stuff. That's like what he does, right? He's like a professor of that, basically. Uh, I'm sure there's a Wikipedia page about the guy. He, he spoke to the RIT Anime Club once before we got there, long before we got there. Yeah, in fact, in the Anime Club library, unless the club stupidly got rid of him, to this day, there are several VHS tapes of his lectures. Yep. Oh, and, wow, Fred Schott has, like, the tiniest little Wikipedia page ever. That needs some beefing up right there. Yeah, he's written a bunch of books, so if you're really interested in, uh, you know, learning a lot about the history of anime and manga and all sorts of intellectualisms around it. Uh, his books are the ones to read pretty much right away. But anyway, he was, you know, digging around doing his research. And in some library, he found like uh, like a card, like a card in the in the index, you know, in the card, the card ca catalog. Right. That thing that we don't use anymore. The you know, card I, I have not physically touched a card catalog since I was in elementary school. I touched one... In high school. And even then, in elementary school, there was a computer. Yep. I used one in high school because the town library had gotten, you know, some like, you know, VT100s hooked up to some kind of system that had a thing, right? You could also dial into it from home, which is cool. Well, and I realized something sadder. I haven't been inside of a library since I was a college student. Yeah, me either. And even then, the only time I ever went into that library was to take a nap or once to get a book that I couldn't find online. In I order would, to write a paper. if I wasn't buying the comics on the cheap from the, the discount place, I would be going to the library to, like, you know, take them out and then bring them back for free. But anyway, so he was digging around once doing research. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because it's in the introduction to the book, which I suggest you read because it's the... I think it's the most, you know, thrilling. Yeah, I know a lot of people skip that sort of thing when they were, you know. That's they, really the most important part of this book. 
I like the people who read Watchmen, and then they skip all those words in between the pictures. You mean the most important parts? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, or at least you know, just as important as the rest of the parts. There's some people who read Watchmen to skip the pirate parts. But the pirate, uh, yeah, we've talked about that. We've I think. Anyway, so it talks about how Frederick Show discovered this manga written by Henry Kiyama. You know, when he was you know chronicling his his life as a, a Japanese immigrant in the U.S. in the early 20th century, Industrial Revolution, roaring t- early roaring 20s kind of times, and also during the kind of ascendance of Japan to the world stage. I mean, this is right around the the. Uh, the Russian-Japanese War, which was basically two semi-Western powers fighting to show who was more Western, and apparently Western men have a big old war. War, but basically, war. it's the story of this guy, and he's a pretty smart, intellectual guy, but because he's, you know, Japanese in America, you know, he ends up working, you know, like normal kind of, the same kind of jobs that would... I guess stereotypically be given to like, you know, illegal sort of immigrants from Mexico nowadays, you know, working in a kitchen, cleaning up someone's house. That's that's the sort of thing he was doing in those days. Yeah, the comic itself is 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 semi autobiographical. It basically follows these four different Japanese immigrants to the US and they both take four somewhat different paths. One of them ends up gambling a lot and one of them's an art student and one of them's kind of the main guy and it just it follows them through these short kind of sketches i mean there, there's not really any one overarching story there's just a whole bunch of short bits about different aspects of life in the in the 19-aughts and the 1920s as a japanese immigrant in san francisco yep the first part of it i think is is sort of funnier but also really sad in that it mostly shows them trying to get jobs you know struggling to get a job in someone's house and then screwing up at the job and being told to go home and they keep, you know, it's funny because it's like, don't get told, go home, go home. Oh, I got told, go home. Not again. I think what's most <laughs> fascinating, though, is and Scott mentioned this at the beginning, that this is written bilingually and, and uh, showed even talks about how that's probably why this comic basically failed when it was pu- first published. Was that- I don't think it was published, really. I mean, what, what did he say about how it was published? There couldn't have been that many copies of it, right? Well, there was the, the real trouble was that there was no market for something like this because it was written bilingually. It was written in English and in Japanese, and it kind of mixes between the two. And if a character would say something in English, they said it in English. And yep. if they said something in Japanese, they said it in Japanese. And it's interesting looking at how he obviously he knew enough English to get by, but he wasn't super well-versed in English. And, and as you definitely see that in his English writing. And yep. at the same time, he actually makes, according to Fred, a lot of mistakes in the Japanese writing, too. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, he's not like, you know, I mean, we make mistakes and we write in English and that's our first language. So, of course, a Japanese speaker who's well, not doesn't well, have an editor you, and a proofreader is going to make mistakes. You may make mistakes. OK, but, <laughs> but, you know, without an editing and a proofreading, there's going to be mistakes even in your first language. But, you know, I think that uh, I think show made a really good decision when he was translating it is anything that was originally written in English. He left it as is. so You can see the original lettering that was done by hand, but all the Japanese, he sort of erased it and then typed in the English, but he tried not to like, you know, like ruin the bubbles or anything. So a lot of times, like it's hard to read it because, you know, he's, it's more about preserving the history than preserving the content. I yeah, think don't that's think the right this, way to go with this book. Don't think of this as a comic. You're just going to read. Think of it as kind of a, a primary historical source. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. Anyway, so, uh, what were your favorite parts in this thing here? Oh, you want to get right to that because you ran out of anything uh, intellectual or insightful to say about it? I think a lot of the things intellectual to say about it are, uh, you know, sort of like said in the introduction, you know, and it's like, what, what, I don't know. One thing I can say, I just, I love reading any sort of piece written con- by t- contemporaries to the air. I mean, that's why I'm reading a lot of Roman and Greek histories now, and I was reading this old Japanese poet who wrote about how he used to do the same thing. I love that sort of thing. It gives oh. you a really interesting, <laughs> if somewhat biased perspective. No. But One thing that I, I remember is actually really interesting about this is that it's done, le- well, every page is like six panels, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Sort of like two across and three down, and they're all the same size. So he wasn't really experimenting with the paneling that much. You know, it wasn't really that kind of thing. But it's left to right, and it was originally left to right. And according to Shote, apparently, you know, because the, the mangas of the time, you know, people were copying the American comics and whatnot. They did it left to right, even though their language went from right to left. And... 
you can see a lot of the panels are they're numbered. He writes, you know, he puts it in the bottom right corner the number one, two, three, four, five, six, so that people know which order to read them in. And I, I thought that was pretty interesting right there, because you know, of course, now we have all these mangas that are right to left, and we're like, no, don't flip them, don't flip them. And originally, you know, the the uh, the manga people weren't even flipping American comics to read right to left; they were writing their own comics left to right to match us. I think actually the what it was said best in terms of what you'll get out of this by Will Eisner of all people. Kiyama's The Four Immigrants manga is a treasure. Like the Yellow Click Kid and Jigs and Maggie. I actually don't know what Jigs and Maggie is. It's I know another the, one of those old comics. Yeah, I know the Yellow Kid. Yep. I know what it is. I I read one of them in a in a social studies book once in middle school. Mm -hmm. It is a splendid and authentic example of the immigrant literature of the period. More candid and outspoken than any of its contemporaries it is a classic that demonstrates the true literary role of the comics to reflect ordinary life. Moreover, it is a fun read. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty much nails it. Yeah, the thing is, it it does, especially later, it deals with very serious, very depressing, very just kind of bad issues, but it... it it deals with them in such light. Like when he, one of the characters decides, all right, I'm going to go fight in the war and come back and get my citizenship. And he goes, and he fights in the war. And it's a very kind of comic couple of panel of, I fought in the war and he gets back and now he tries to get his citizenship. And they're like, ah, no. And he's like, ah, all that work for nothing. But if you think about what actually happened there. <laughs> it's sort of disturbing in a way that, the whole thing feels kind of lighthearted because of the way the comic is done, but some of the subject matter is really heavy. It's like, oh, God, you know, like... Like the one guy who was, uh, his face was deformed in an accident while he was working on the farm, and now he's trying to get a bride, so he takes a picture to hide his deformity, and then he gets a picture bride from Japan, and then he puts a plaster over half his face to try to hide it until the wedding happens. And then the plaster falls off and, and, and all hell breaks loose. And that that's one of the stories. And it kind of ends on that note. Yeah. It, it's, but it, the way that it, it treats that, you know, serious material is very light. And it's sort of like, uh, I guess it sort of, it helps though, because if he, if he dealt with it seriously, it would be sort of difficult to read this thing without getting really depressed really quickly. You'd be like, oh, God, life is so terrible. God damn. But maybe that's just, you know, the way the guy was. You know, he, he sort of, you know, he lived in a in a horrible kind of situation, at least from our perspective. But maybe, you know, that was his attitude, is that he was sort of a, a lighthearted kind of guy. And he well, started... actually, from what I remember reading in the intro, he talked about how he wasn't a lighthearted guy and how other people were and how he wanted to reflect that in some of the characters. Yeah, all right. That sounds good to me. But yeah, it's, I think the most thing, the... The most important thing out of this manga is not the manga itself, you know, which isn't, you know, it's not like the greatest manga of all time or anything, but it's historical significance and the context of it. And, uh, you know, you get to see an account of the history of the time, you know, from someone who was living it uncensored and full on, you know. Being... I mean, he talks about the San Francisco earthquake and all sorts of the World's Fair when it comes to town. Yeah. I mean, imagine, you know, I mean, you read history books, which is someone writing about something or writing about something or writing about something, right? This is a guy who was alive during the time, writing during the time in comic form about what he and his friends were living at the time. And, you know, at that time, I guess this is a topical work, you know, and now it's a historical work. And I guess that's the, the thing about all topical works is they become historical works eventually. Honestly, I think that's all I have to say about it. Yeah, it's not much to say. It's not very long. It's just one book. I bought it on Amazon, so you should be able to buy it on Amazon also. If you go on Google Books, actually, if you search for it, for Immigrants Manga on Google, there's a Google Books entry that shows up right away that has, like, the introduction and the table of contents and a few of the pages and both cut. It has a lot of the pages from it, not the whole thing. It, it, it mostly, you're, you're only going to get like two pages of comic, but you get almost all the other non-comic pages. It's not, it's not. If nothing else, even if you don't want to buy this, at least read that opening introduction. Because there's even like pictures of the guy and pictures from the era. Because there were a lot of Japanese immigrants in uh, San Francisco yeah. at that time. I mean, the thing really feels a lot like sort of an exhibit in a museum, you know, where you read the little card and all the good stuff is on the little card. And then you look through the glass at the actual artifacts and that's just sort of like, you know, you apply what you got from the card to the artifact, and now suddenly there's meaning to it. If you just look at the artifact in the glass right away, it's just like, okay, there's a little statue in the glass. Very, very nice. You know, it looks cool. 
So yeah, I know it's kind of a short episode, but what do you want from us? We've actually been going long a lot lately, so this will give the Libsyn a little bit of a rest until we upgrade it. Yeah, maybe we can upgrade that Libsyn sooner rather than later, then make some extra shit or something, I don't know. I don't think we're going to get anything extra done until after Katsukan. Probably not, but that's pretty much the only... From Katsukan until, like, July is the only time we're going to have, because then, shit's on! Yeah, especially if we uh, do what we might be talking about tomorrow, but uh, we'll talk about that. What are we talking about tomorrow? This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an audio on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.